but the other thing is also important we get independent assessment of the uh, socio economic benefits and three seasons uh, were assessment is over fourth season report is getting ready and what do we find that there is a significant decrease in the cost of cultivation between natural farming and the conventional agriculture there is really no yield penalty but even if there is a slight yield penalty because of the extensive cost reduction there is significant increase in net income for our farmers not only that the farmers are reporting better soil health crop health resilience biodiversity less water requirement and for uh, farmers better health and for the consumers better health welcome everyone i'm didi pursehouse with land and leadership initiative and i wanted to open this session of with a little exercise cuz one of the things that uh vj and i both have learned in our work is that people learn best when it's tied into their own experience their own embodied experience so i wanted to bring you right into this by having you think about a successful project that you've been involved in uh in any aspect of your life and uh it could be something that you were directly part of or leading or it could be something that you witnessed around you and i want you to think about and you can feel free to post some of your reflections into that q and a box think about what did people need to be able to do functionally and how was that capacity built what woke up people's will and kept them awake and engaged to bring it to fruition how did people need to be in order to participate in meaningful ways and how did they regenerate that needed state of being when things got hard or discouraging where did they source that way of being that will that will willingness and that capacity building from so we'll just take a moment to let people post a few reflections in the Q&A and while you're doing that i just want to welcome my colleague vijay kumar from where i'm sitting looking at the snow outside in vermont and he's uh, sitting in i think right now in hyderabad india uh, probably in a very warm place and uh last november though we were together in andhra pradesh walking through these incredible diverse fields where in in a region that had been very high in pesticides um um very much of a conventional farming state that that this project you'll hear about has converted into a real uh green diverse healthy wonderland so Welcome, Vijay. Thank you, Didi. Uh, thank you for the warm introduction. This uh, effort in Andhra Pradesh, which is uh, you know a state in south of India, is to motivate, empower all six million farmers in our state to change their way of farming. to move into uh, a farming which is in harmony with nature and uh, so this is the effort that is our vision our dream and uh, this is something that i want to talk to you about and first of all why do we want to do this uh, this is our state as you can see south of india we have a 1000 kilometers of coast and then uh, this this area is the semi arid area and 86% of farmers are small and marginal farmers so the average holding is 1 hectare so this is the brief uh, picture of the state and so why do, why should we do this and i believe we are having multiple emergencies we have the livelihoods of farmers which are uh, at high risk and uh, you know affected by the extreme high cost of cultivation because of inputs coming from outside and also this costs are increasing 
at the same time you have uh, you know prolonged dry spells droughts or in some districts more frequent cyclones so the riskiness of agriculture has increased young people are leaving villages and then we have the problems of tenants and then there of course there's market uncertainty so there are a set of factors where i strongly believe that uh, livelihoods of farmers is threatened uh, at the same time as a consumer as a citizen as a uh, you know so, uh, a woman who, uh, who has to feed her children uh, we have multiple problems from the consumer side there's a possibility of food scarcity there's still a lot of hunger in the world and the food we are eating is not safe there are chemical residues there's also heavy metal contamination and at the same time some nutrients which should be there are not there so this is the second emergency then you have a the environmental crisis we are losing soil soil organic matter at a very very fast pace there is a water emergency temperatures are rising air and water are getting polluted there is decrease in biodiversity so there are multiple emergencies and the covid pandemic is also a, a, a symptom of the natural systems breaking down so so this is where we are and the irony is that the very agriculture which is essential to feed all of us is also the biggest cause of climate change the agriculture the food systems so it's estimated that 45 to 53% of the greenhouse gases are on account of the the way we are doing agriculture the way we are producing food the way we are consuming food so so this is really the the most ironical part that uh, the food system itself is the most important contributor to climate change and this is happening because we are losing soil organic matter regularly whether it's through deforestation whether through plowing or keeping lands fallow and over the last uh, 60 70 years the use of biocides which is really finishing off life below the soil so so these are multiple factors which are uh, causing this problem and this is a problem you know which is threatening humanity so this is perhaps one of the existential problems now is there a solution so i just want to quote from bill mollison though the problems of the world are increasingly complex the solutions remain embarrassingly simple you may think i am fooling you but i can assure you that that's not my intention so what we discovered and what so many people across the world are discovering is farming in harmony with nature it's a simple solution but it addresses all the crises that we just discussed and so therefore the the farming that we are promoting in andhra pradesh is what we call as ap community managed natural farming it is regenerative agriculture which is leveraging the power of photosynthesis now what is it there are some universal principles these principles are applicable across all countries all continents and this are again very simple soil needs to be covered 65 days with living plants living root and there should be diverse crops 15 20 crops trees should be incorporated it can't be simpler than that don't disturb the soil integrate animals into farming now because the soil biology is so depressed so you need biostimulants to act as catalysts then we need to keep the soil covered with organic residues mulch we can call it a armor for the soil then using indigenous seeds and pest management to agronomical practices and botanical extracts and finally one red box no synthetic fertilizers no pesticides herbicides weedicides insecticides 
so these are nine principles so the indian speciality is in terms of uh, the biostimulants and the second breakthrough which is very very critical is what we have achieved in india and uh, that is the connect you know with walter and dd because walter is the inspiration for uh, the pre monsoon dry soil which i will describe later uh, this essentially shows that photosynthesis is the driving force and it is the root exudates which are uh, you know uh, very critical so i'll not go into the science behind this but if you do natural farming you are basically bringing carbon from the air into the soil you are improving the water holding capacity of the soil you are ensuring better nutrient absorption mechanism so that the food you are eating is healthy and then you create a very good soil structure so that the soil doesn't get washed away in, during rainy season or wind so this is the uh, you know result of uh, practicing these principles and then we have you know this is what we are doing to see that uh, the soil is covered 365 days of the year with uh, crop diversity this goes against the current principle of having only monocrops so this is the one principle this is something unique to india this is what we call as a microbial seed coating uh, it's called bijamrutam so we we have just shown you it's a you know fermentation process involving cow dung cow urine a bit of lime and a handful of uh, uncontaminated soil and you see uh, uh, the lady here is sprinkling it on the seeds just before sowing then uh, this is another uh, biostimulant these are uh, you know uh, cow dung uh, based uh, inoculum so uh this is the way in which it is made we have plenty of video films to show how this are made so this is a solid inoculum it is used just before sowing it is also used as a split dose during the reproductive phase this is a liquid inoculum which is used uh, you know depending on the crops either every week or every two weeks so then in addition to that we have a number of tonics to be used as foliar sprays there are botanical extracts and farmers are innovating all the time and we use indigenous seeds we have uh, you know there's a tremendous shortage of these seeds so we are working hard to revive the indigenous seeds we're still at a beginning stage we still have a lot of journey to distance to cover here now you may ask does it work so i just want to tell you that you know we started the program in 2016 with 40000 farmers from 700 villages so we already covered 700000 farmers and farm workers and this year we we hope god willing to touch 1 million farmers and farm workers and the number of villages has increased from 700 to close to 4000 villages so this happened over 5 years we are supported by a very we are supported mostly by government funding and by philanthropy azim prem ji philanthropic initiatives and this year we also got funding from the kfw bank germany so from 40000 if we could move to 1 million farmers that means farmers who i believe are the best scientists best trainers so they are certainly convinced with this and they want to make this change so we are now in one third of the villages of the state and we cover 16% of farmers so we are at a tipping point the but the other thing is also important we get independent assessment of the uh, socio economic benefits and three seasons uh, were assessment is over fourth season report is getting ready and what do we find so there is a significant decrease in the cost of cultivation between natural farming and the conventional agriculture there is really no yield penalty but even if there is a slight yield penalty because of the extensive cost reduction there is significant increase in net income for our farmers not only that 
the farmers are reporting better soil health, crop health, resilience, biodiversity, less water requirement, and for uh, farmers, better health, and for the consumers, better health. These are some of the crops. This is a paddy crop. This is a corn crop. Again, you can see intercrops. There'll be border crops. This is the corn. This is a millet called foxtail millet. These are chili peppers, very hot. Uh, this is black pepper, coffee. And not only the yields are better, but more important is resilience. 2020, we witnessed uh, unseasonal rainfalls in September, October, November. So in this photograph, you can see this, both the fields were under water for almost 10 days. But when the water receded, the natural farming plot revived immediately. There's hardly any damage, but the neighboring floor plot was completely damaged. So the farmer suffered 100% loss here. Same thing here, and which had come for harvesting. At that time, the neighboring farmer lost his crop. The natural farming farmer got his full crop. And we were able to see what are the differences in the crops. And uh, this is a natural farming cotton field. You can see the difference you know, uh, in, uh, in its uh, resilience. So this is very, very important that uh, not only the yields are better, the costs are less, but resilience, because it's going to become increasingly important as you know, the weather patterns change. And then uh, we have as a bonus, uh, improved uh, biodiversity. We have more earthworms, almost nine times more earthworms compared to a conventional plot. Then we have increase in uh, uh, insects, uh, beneficial insects. And then you can see birds here. The bird population in these fields has increased. And there are some farmers who appreciate these benefits as much as they benefit the, see the economic benefits. And then we see very positive impact on health. So therefore we are working with uh, the preschool children. We're working with pregnant women, uh, nursing mothers, because uh, we believe that, you know, uh, women who are pregnant should not eat any chemically produced food. So we are doing this piloting in all these villages with the, with the preschools and the nutrition centers for uh, pregnant women and nursing mothers. Uh, these are some of the you know, training programs happening there. This is a, a kitchen garden or a homestead garden plan for the nutrition center of the government. And this is our efforts to involve the school children. And uh, we're also looking at those who are, uh, you know, landless. So what do we do for them? So we decided that, you know, we should first promote uh, homestead gardens. And we have around 30% uh, of the households who are, uh, you know, landless farm workers, most vulnerable group. So we have a very special strategy to, to, for, to support them, but to start with, we are ensuring that they have uh, homestead gardens, you know, 10, 15, 20 different kinds of vegetables, fruit trees. And during the COVID pandemic, this really helped these uh, uh, families to get all these uh, nutrients at their doorstep. So, of course, I'll go into, you know, how we overcame the hurdles, etc. So over to you, Didi, for an interjection here. It's so great to see those photos. And um, one of the things that I love about being involved in this project is that we have a, a WhatsApp group and like almost every morning I see such hopeful, beautiful pictures that remind me of how, how the world is supposed to work in terms, of, uh, in terms of seeing those nesting birds right there where our food is being grown seeing people with their armfuls, arms full of diverse food that I know is nutrient dense, seeing things surviving after storms, people and crops um, surviving. And I, I just think that this project is such a great uh, inspiration, but not just, not just 
inspiration, but actually we have very, very significant steps as to how, how it got carried out and what is the background for that with these uh, women's self-help groups that I think we'll talk a little bit more about as well. So um, I, I wanted to uh, invite people to, to think about something while we take maybe just a little stretch break. So if you people wanna get up and stretch and move around, but I'm gonna pose a, another question for you, which is to, uh, I, I know many of you are in uh, urban areas, but I suspect that you have spent weekends or summers in, uh, in the forests and mountains surrounding Boston or wherever you are. And I want you to think about a summer week in, in the city, uh, especially a city, a place in the city where there's not very many trees. And imagine what it's like to uh, go to sleep at night without any air conditioning and uh, how you feel over the, the night, what's happening with the water cycle, where is the water is in the air, that humidity that you can feel, uh, waking, waking up, what's going on outside, uh, what, what does the sky look like, go try taking off your shoes and go out for a walk barefoot on the pavement in the middle of the day, or maybe you jump into the park if you can and get under a tree. So now, and then once you take yourself from there and go to the countryside, to a lush, green, diverse countryside on that same hot summer week. And in the morning, you wake up and you step outside and your feet are moist with dew. The, the grass, the plants, all are moist. And then you watch that mist coming up in the morning and it's turning into these like uh, clouds spread out. But as the afternoon comes, or in some places this happens earlier in the day, that kind of humidity all comes together into big puffy clouds. And just at the time when you're ready to go swimming, boom, you have a big rainstorm <laughs> and you cool off. And then at night, you can see the stars above you. You have a completely clear sky and all of the heat that has collected on the earth during the day can escape back out to space. So to, to just Compare in your mind the difference between a natural landscape functioning during the day and the water cycle and how that is impacting the plants and the people and the animals versus an unnatural urban landscape. Uh, I wanted you to have that image in your mind while we shift into talking a little bit about, uh, about Walter Yena's work. So thank you. So how, how did this scaling up happen from 40,000 farmers to 1 million uh, farmers and farm workers? So uh, I believe that there are some very critical innovations which uh, led to this. And please remember that we have to work with a mindset of chemical addiction of the last 60 years. There are Western interests. Also you have to reach out to every farmer and support the farmer to make this transformation. And in a situation where the extension system is poor, and how does this alternative paradigm become the mainstream? How is it self-sustaining? So I believe that in Andhra Pradesh, we have uh, fostered several critical innovations. So I'll spend some time, but most important is the government support and government advocacy of uh, a alternative paradigm, which itself is a, is a very rare thing, but we were able to negotiate that uh, space. And uh, that is very, very important because this can be a, a very powerful roadblock. And then the, the knowledge, the knowledge is uh, around the natural farming, around farming in harmony with nature. But I'll talk to you about 
the the most important uh, factors which actually powered this change and that is the role of women self help groups as paul mentioned that we we seeded this uh, program around 20 years ago and uh, uh, today in andhra pradesh 90% of rural women are organized into self help groups uh, so a state got split in 2014 so we have around 8.3 million women in rural areas organized into self help group so our program actually the foundation is this network of women self help groups and what do they do their ownership of the program actually enables this kind of uh, scaling up to happen first and foremost through their meeting processes they support you know those members who are making the transformation because many members many farmers are hesitant because the neighbors may laugh at them or within the household there are disputes but in the case of a self help group it's a very supportive group so this is very important in enabling the first person second person in that group to make this change they also participate in collective action so through this collective action in preparing the biostimulants or other preparations they not only learn but help each other so this is collective action leading to peer learning they prepare plans they identify the most vulnerable members see what extra support they require and they finance the transition because the women self help groups are also able to raise money from the banks from their own savings and finance the transformation and many of them told me that they are happy with this rather than buying chemicals so this is the kind of training that happens uh, so so this this is the most important driving force in this program is the network of our uh, women self help groups uh, there is another important pillar is uh, who is the person taking the knowledge to the farmers so it's not some expert taking this to the farmer expert meaning the one who has got a degree in agriculture or a masters in agriculture no we are talking about inspiring farmers champion farmers so here we have a, a 70 year old sarojini amma so she has done this she is a best practitioner so she takes this knowledge to farmers comes back with farmers best practices shares that with other champion farmers so this is a continuous exchange of information practices happening through champions so today we have close to 6000 champion farmers who are uh, leading this uh, transformation uh with the help of the women self help groups and then of course we use ict uh, video communications in making this possible and this is very important is we have to be patient it doesn't the change it doesn't happen overnight there is a journey of a farmer she may require 3 to 4 years to because this is knowledge intensive agriculture this is not something available on the tab buying something from a, things in the field no this is understanding of the plants understanding of the soil understanding of the insects the birds all this is very important so this knowledge intensive part so we believe it may take three years for three to six years and then we also have the whole village taking this so this also takes about five years so anywhere between five to eight years is what needs to be invested in a village or a group of villages for this transformation to happen so this requires say facilitating organization could be an ngo could be a government organization could be farmers producer organization so this is very very critical uh, without this rest of it will not happen so so we have a women self help group we have champion farmers we have a facilitating organization which takes a long term point of view and works with every farmer diligently to enable this transformation to happen uh i now uh, take you through the 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 process which you know was triggered by walter's lectures and i am so happy to learn that uh, you know 
Paula was responsible for making this connection between, uh, you know, Walter, Dee Dee, and uh, uh, Paula. And I heard Walter's lectures given in 2016 in Vermont. And that inspired me to try this initiative. Uh, Walter argues that, uh, it's a fact actually, that there is water in the air and in tropics, you have up to 50,000 parts per million. So the question which came in my mind was, the, does regenerative agriculture somehow enable this water to be harnessed? And it's only after listening to Walter's lectures six to eight times, I got the courage to try this initiative. And uh, what we are telling farmers is to, in India, monsoon system is very important. So, but we are asking farmers to do the sowing in the summer months itself. So we have one window which starts from April, moves on to October. And then we have a winter season from November onwards. And uh, we started with just 11 farmers. With just 11 farmers in 2018 and 2020, we could get 100,000 farmers to try this out. And you can see this, uh, you know, last November visit of Walter and DD to India. And they're visiting this lush green field when uh, no other farmer has taken a crop because it didn't rain well there. And uh, you can see here, we started with 11 farmers in 2018. This year we have reached out to 100,000 farmers. And from April, 2021, I'm targeting 300,000 farmers. And that is the power of this uh, great innovation. And just to give you an example, that this farmer in the same district, without this intervention, would have been able to take only one crop if it rained well. So between July to October, he would take a groundnut crop, peanuts, and also a lentil crop. So if the rainfall is good, he will end up with about 43,000 rupees income for the whole year. But more important, for eight months of the year, the soil is bare. And uh, see, 17 out of 20 years have been drought years. So this is the risk a farmer is facing, and that's why many of them migrate. But thanks to this very unique intervention, we now have the same farmer taking crops throughout the year, starting from March. March to June is the pre-monsoon window chosen by this farmer. And he has taken about 15, 20 crops. These are uh, cereals, uh, pulses, oil seeds, vegetables, uh, tubers, leafy vegetables. And again, in the main season, uh, he has taken groundnut crop, but also with a lot of cereals and uh, pulses. In the winter, there's a lot of uh, vegetable crops here. So this is what we call 365 days uh, green cover. And this is our model. You can see here the farmer, you know, doing seed treatment. We also pellet the seeds and we cover the ground with mulch. And uh, by monitoring and maintaining these fields, you see the result of this farmer. So not only the ground is covered, so doing a lot of good for soil fertility, but it also do the, uh, is the farmer is doing well economically. So this first season also has got about 16,000 rupees. In the second season, close to 60,000 rupees. And the third season, around 30,000 rupees. So the same farmer, same year, same season, by changing the practices, this farmer is able to get about 107,000 rupees. Uh, but in a conventional field, he got only 40,000 rupees. So two and a half times increase in the income. But more important is the you know, enhancement of soil fertility, the diet diversity. This collectively, you know, 15, 20 crops available in the field at all times. So this is what I call as a, as a miracle. This is uh, his plot now, the way it looks in December, this is aerial view. And we have another farmer this field was fallow for more than 10 years. It's come to life uh, because of this initiative.
and again shiv shankar's plot uh, shot to a drone and we have the other innovation has been you know we have got very eminent organizations and scientists working with us to establish the science or to bring innovations so we have the united nations uh, united nations fao the world agroforestry center university of reading walter dd and there are many other uh, you know organizations we uh, we are privileged to work with all of them and they are looking at what kind of research needs to be done we don't have all the answers but the farmers are moving ahead because whatever they are getting is much better than what they dreamt was possible because farmers felt they were trapped you know it's either that you can only practice chemical agriculture or you give up farming so they felt they were in a trap and that's why they decided to you know give this a trial and we want to make it a very strong knowledge based uh, you know practices knowledge based interventions uh, i'm also happy to report that uh, we are finding a lot of interest within the country we have uh, you know currently there's a team from meghalaya visiting us in spite of covid uh, so we have about eight nine country uh, states in the country both from the eastern side western side north and the south and we are also grateful that governments of rwanda kenya mexico have shown interest in understanding what we are doing so i i just want to conclude by saying that yes we are in a very serious crisis and not one crisis multiple emergencies but the solution is with us solution is with all of us that means each one of us has a role in the, in the solution space and we need to do it quickly we can't wait for 50 years to do this so so what is really required is can we do it quickly can we do it in time but i believe that every citizen on this planet has a role and that is the hope uh, that if we do it correctly we may be able to stop this uh, crisis in time and uh, uh, i am doing it because i believe that this is the best thing that we can do for not only our generation but more important for the children i'll conclude here dd and uh, await the interaction on various uh, questions that could have been that could have come up thank you thank you vita that was wonderful to hear that full story put together so beautifully and i just love seeing the pictures and the charts that the net income increase in the farmers i think is so key uh because so many parts of the world that's that is uh, what people say is why we can't switch but but in fact you your farmers have really proven uh that that is not the case that that there are tremendous gains to be had in income and in the crop resilience is the other key thing and i think that as we go on i'm really looking forward to seeing the health data starting to come back um, particularly with covid but also just all of the diseases that the world is facing on a modern uh chemical a chemical based diet uh, you know chemical farming conventional farming there's so many issues that that have come up and i i think we're going to see some very significant results in the health of people in under pradesh as as this goes forward so as someone who used to be a healthcare pr practitioner i'm very interested in that particular piece so um we have some very interesting questions that have come in and i will um it's going to be a little hard to pick and choose here but i'm going to um snag a couple of them uh one is what are the challenges that the that the farmers or you know that you faced in getting the farmers to adopt this were they enthusiastic about it how did that interface um go yeah it's a difficult question because i overcame those hurdles uh, quite some time ago uh but what is important is the person going to the farmers was a person who had done this succeeded and then she or he 
as they call the champion farmer. The champion farmers entered the villages and uh, they were able to, oh, in some cases it took them three months to get the first farmer to change. Mm -hmm. So it's not easy, but then we had uh, taken the help of those farmers who themselves had struggled, come out victorious. So I still remember one of my champion farmers telling me, sir, you're paying me so much, but in spite of my going to every farmer's doorstep, they're telling me, oh, you're talking nonsense. It can't be done. So, but took him three months to get the first farmer. Mm. And when I visited him after six months, he said, sir, I don't have time even to take lunch now because I get bombarded <laughs> by calls. So there are different entry points and there is no one particular theory. So these champions, the introduction of the champions was my solution. There can mm. be many problems. Some people simply say there is a problem even if there is no problem. And some people don't recognize problems, they recognize opportunities. Yeah, yeah. Many cases, the champion farmers, in order to convince other farmers, took a plot of land on lease and said, I'll cultivate. You watch me. If I'm successful, you follow me. So this I have to thank these heroes. Yes. This reminds me of the story you told me when before we actually had met in person about the women from the women's self-help economic groups going home and having a big argument with their family and how Absolutely. it resolved. Can you tell that? Can you tell that? <laughs> oh, many cases, you know, the women wanted to change because of the self-help group, but the husband resisted. The, you know, the in-laws, you know, the mother-in-law, the father-in-law said, what nonsense are you talking? But this lady was very resolute. She said, no, my group is not wrong. She, they told me. So finally, like Solomon's judgment, they decided, okay, we have two acres of land. One acre, you do your method. One acre, I'll do my method. And they said that if you don't uh, succeed, then you have to follow me. She said, yes, if I succeed, you have to follow me. And 100% of the cases, the husband ended up following the wife. Because <laughs> the woman was right. She was more <laughs> successful. So and, uh, and these successful women actually became my trainers. So those who fought with their husbands and convinced them, I said, okay, you can convince your husband, you can convince 100 people. Yes, and, and I think I'm, what that gets at to me, the reason I love that story is because I don't think those conversations or arguments would happen without knowing that they could go back to their self-help group to report, you know, they had that strength of the group behind them. Absolutely, because yeah. that group is extremely critical because the reason why in many parts of the world this does not scale up is the person who is motivated doesn't get there's no automatic support system readily available because the support system is for a destructive agriculture. So it takes time to put in place a support system. Yeah. It's like, you know, you have to lay the railway track and then you run the engine. So here we are laying the track and then <laughs> putting the engine. So it's, it's not a small, it's not an easy task. Yes. And so another question that's quite interesting to me is how resilient or sustainable is it to rely on government funds for this kind of community project? Are we prolonging our dependence? If the, see this is a reality, the biggest pool of money is with the government. All of us are paying taxes. So the biggest pool of money is with the government. As a citizen, you have a right over the utilization of the money. So you want the government to use the money that you are paying. It's your it's not it's not government money it's your money so do you want your money to be used in destructive agriculture to kill you or you want the money to save you the choice is yours mm -hmm. thank you <laughs> very true uh, a, a couple of um, practical questions how how does natural farming deal with pests and diseases I, I that's one of the things I was fascinated by seeing yeah, I, I think the, the, the plants are also clever. So if you plant, uh, you put a seed in unhealthy soil, then it will be a weak plant. So, so the natural farming process itself result in healthier plants coming up. And so they're able to repel pests on their own. 
But in addition, we are not doing monocropping. So we are having multiple crops. So the insects get confused, the pests get confused. So that is another uh, principle. But we also have certain, uh, you know, botanical formulations if the pest load becomes too much. So there are multiple practices. Yes, so but you're using like an herbal, that herbal in the long run. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the herbal application. But we believe in the long run, the, there is an equilibrium established. And so there's really no, no need to do anything around pests because these things get sorted out by themselves. Many farmers tell me now, who are in the fifth year, saying that we don't have a pest problem now. Our soil is healthy. We have so many, you know, birds, insects. So they are eating these pests. Yes, and I think there's a there's a new movie out that last year in the states called The Biggest Little Farm, which, uh, of course, they put a lot of money into the farm, but it's a great it's a great example of how one part of an ecosystem will balance things out. That first you have this problem, but if you just wait, then something else comes yeah. in to eat to eat that. You know. <laughs> so, uh, we have a question uh, that Annie just posted uh, uh, from the Q&A. Are the champion farmers paid for their work teaching new farmers? Do they do it full time? Do they have transportation to reach new farmers? How does that practical? Uh, absolutely, we pay them. It's uh, you know very remunerative. At the same time, we insist that the champion farmer continues to be a best practitioner. So we verify their fields. Hmm. You know, we have another set of independent people. You know, we don't want people just to give lectures. We want people to practice. So we have champion farmers. We pay them well. We pay them for transportation. At the same time, we want them to be farmers. We want them to be farmers so that all the innovations that are coming up, these champion farmers should practice it. So I also told them that, you know, we have a grading system so that you will continue in this program if your farm is better th than other farms, if your income stream is like this, if you practice pre-monsoon dry sowing. So each year we add the hurdles that they have to cross to continue to be on the job. Mm -hmm. How do we take the successes from India and apply them to other places in the world, in including in the United States where a lot of our listeners are from? And I, I you may or may not have the answer, but I'm very curious to hear your thinking. I think, uh, Didi, it's a question of your willpower. Do you want to do it or not? If you want to do it, the solutions are there. It's not a rocket science. Whatever I have said, they are so simple. And so what is the difficulty? It's up to you. It's, I think the biggest battle is in our own mindset. Do we want to do it or are we searching for excuses? It can yeah. be done, as I said, there are universal principles apply in all the continents. And I have learned so much from farmers of USA. I've watched Gabe Brown's video so many times. He's inspired me. I watched his first video in 2016, just when I uh, watched uh, Walter's video or uh, you know, uh, Elaine Ingham's videos. So I have been inspired by farmers of America. I've been inspired by farmers in Africa and uh, uh, the great movement of Via Campesino in uh, South America. So there are examples across the world, but ultimately it depends on you. Yes. Nobody can force you either, but only, only one thing I want to caution that the inaction of this generation, because we've already done enough damage, our continued inaction, especially when solutions are known, to me is unforgivable. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Didi.